Okay, so today we're going to be designing a proximity service. So a proximity service like Yelp, these are applications that help users find and access various services like businesses and points of interest based on their current location. And so designing a proximity service is a very popular system design question as it covers many core system design concepts, including storing and retrieving data from multiple data sources, scalability, reliability, and interacting with geolocation services. So looking at the requirements, so firstly for the functional requirements, we'll want users to be able to create an attraction. So these are locations of services, businesses, etc. Then we'll also want users to be able to search attractions based on query search terms, like you know the type of the restaurant, what type of business it is, how many ratings it has. And then we also want users to be able to add reviews to an attraction so that other users of the service can see what other people think of those attractions. And then for the non-functional requirements, we want high scalability as we want this to be able to handle not only millions of attractions, but also to be able to handle millions of users querying those attractions. And then we also want high availability so that when a user makes a request, they will always get a response. And we're willing to accept eventual consistency here as the nature of the data isn't very important. Unlike financial applications where seeing the most up-to-date number is very important. And then we also want low latency so that when a user makes a request, they get a response very quickly without having to wait for a long period of time. And then if we look at some high level estimates, so firstly for storage, let's say we've got 50 million daily active users. We can also assume that there's roughly a thousand attractions added every day and that the average number of reviews posted by a user is two per month. And then that the average attraction size, including you know, metadata and images, is roughly 5,000 kilobytes, and that the average review size is around two kilobytes. So therefore we can compute that the yearly attraction storage will be 1,000 attractions multiplied by 365 days, multiplied by the average attraction size, which would be 500 kilobytes, which will give us roughly 182.5 gigabytes. And then for the yearly review storage, we've got 50 million users. They're doing two reviews a month, so multiply that by 12 and then we've got the average review size which is two kilobytes so multiply all those together and we get roughly 2.4 terabytes and then to get the total yearly storage we can simply add those two and that's going to give us roughly 2.6 terabytes per year so it's a decent amount of storage and it's something we have to take into consideration when designing our system and then for the queries per second so firstly we're going to look at the rights per second for attractions so we've got a thousand attractions added every day and then we're going to divide that by the number of seconds in a day so we've got 24 hours multiplied by 3600 seconds which is the number of seconds in an hour and that's going to give us roughly 0 0.0116 rights per second and then we also want to get the rights per second for reviews and so to calculate that we're gonna get 50 million users, multiply that by two reviews, because they do two reviews on average every month, and then divide that by the number of seconds in a month. So on average, there's 30 days in a month, multiply that by 24 hours, and then the number of seconds in an hour, 3,600, and that'll give us roughly 38.58 writes per second. And so therefore, we've got a total writes per second of roughly 38.59. And so then we also have to assume that on average, a user will make roughly 20 read requests per month. And so therefore to get the reads per second, we will multiply 50 million users by the 20 reads and then divide that by the number of seconds in a month. And that'll give us roughly 385.8 reads per second. And so then to get the queries per second, we'll add up the writes per second and the reads per seconds, and that'll give us roughly 424 queries per second. So it's a relatively high queries per second and we need to make sure that we design our system to be able to handle such a load. And then looking at the data model, so this is just a basic outline of some of the core tables that can be included in a proximity service data model. Obviously in a production environment, there'll be a lot more tables, but we're just gonna focus on some of the core tables here. So we've got the users table, so that will contain all user related information. We'll also then have the attractions table, so I'll have the attraction ID, the user ID, which indicates the user that created that attraction, we'll have the latitude and longitude, as well as the geo hash and so the geo hash is what we're going to be using to help identify locations within a given search radius and we're going to dive deeper into that later and then obviously attractions will also have media associated with them so videos and pictures 
And so we'll have the media type. So I'll say whether it's an image or a video and then the media URL. So this is where that file will be located. And then we'll also have reviews because attractions can have reviews. So it'll have a user ID associated with it. So who created that review and attraction ID. So what attraction is associated with this review and then a rating as well as the, a comment which will contain the actual content of the review. So again, very high level, but it focuses on the core tables that will be expected in this system design. And then for the API design, so for a proximity service, we could use a classic RESTful API to interact with the data. RESTful APIs are simple, they're widely used, they're stateless, and they support caching, which make it a good candidate for our system. So again, in a production system, there will be lots of endpoints, but in this system, we're just going to focus on three core endpoints. So the first one will be the post request, which will go to the API attractions endpoint, which will obviously be used to create an attraction. And so some of the parameters that could be included could be a media, which could be an array of binary files, as well as you know the name, the latitude, longitude, as well as metadata information. And then hopefully, if it's successfully created, we'd expect a 201 status code response. And then the second endpoint would be the API attraction search endpoint. So this would enable users to search using a query parameter to get specific attractions. And so that could include the parameters would include the query, a latitude, a longitude, a radius, you know, a category, as well as some pagination information. And then if that was successful, we'd expect a 200 response code. And then finally, we would want a post endpoint to create a review. So again, the parameters here would include the attraction ID, the user ID, a rating, a comment, and potentially media as well, if we wanted to enable users to be able to upload their own images of that attraction. And again, if it was successful, we would expect a 201 uh, created. And so I think the best way to really understand this architecture is to walk through some of the main flows in the application. And then hopefully by the end of it, you'll get a full picture of what the architecture looks like, as well as be able to understand how all the components interact with each other. So the first flow we're going to look at is the creating an attraction flow. So a user will first send a post request and this, this user must be signed in and they will send a post request to the API attractions uh, endpoint. The load balancer will then route that request to an instance of the attraction write service, which will be horizontally scaled as we want to be able to facilitate high load here. It also performs rate limiting using either a sliding window or a token bucket algorithm to ensure that the service does not get overwhelmed by malicious users. And this helps maintain high availability and prevents service abuse. And so the images included in the request are then uploaded to an object storage service, you know, such as Amazon S3 by the attraction write service. And then these images are then added to a CDN, so a content delivery network to ensure fast and reliable delivery to users across the globe. And then finally, the URLs which then point to those stored images are then returned and then will be used to reference the image in the attractions table. Once the images are returned, the attraction write service can then calculate the geohash of the location. And so the geohash of a location is calculated based on the provided latitude and longitude. And so geohashing is a method of encoding latitude and longitude coordinates into a single string of letters and digits, which allow for efficient proximity searches by spatially indexing the location data. The length of the geohash determines the precision of the location representation. So for instance, longer geohashes represent more precise locations. So for our implementation strategy, we're going to store the, a full eight character geohash. And so this has a precision of roughly 38 meters. And then we're going to store this geohash in the database for each attraction. And so therefore, for broader searches, we can use a prefix matching on the first five to six characters to get a more broad overview. And then for more precise local searches, so for example, within built up cities like London or New York, where there could be lots of different attractions in a very small area, we could then use the full eight characters. And if you don't know much about geohashing, I highly recommend reading up on it. There's a link in the description. Alternatively, you could use a quadtree implementation, which is a data, which is a tree data structure in which each internal node has exactly four children. And so quadtrees are used to partition a two dimensional space by recursively subdividing it into four quadrants or regions. However, for this system design, we'll focus on using GeoHash due to its simplicity and efficiency for our use case. And so once we've calculated the GeoHash, we can then store the attraction. So the attraction details, including the geohash, you know, the image URLs, the name, its latitude and longitude are all then stored in the main Postgres database. And so a Postgres database is chosen because it supports PostGIS, which is an extension that provides robust spatial database capabilities, enabling efficient geospatial queries. For example, 
distance calculations and area overlapping. And if you don't know what post GIS is or you haven't heard of it before, I'd highly recommend reading up on it as it's a fundamental part of this system design. So once we've stored the attraction, we can then put a message onto a message queue, and this will be for non-critical metadata uh, processing. And so this message will contain all the metadata about, about a spe specific attraction, and this can be implemented with something like RabbitMQ or Kafka. The metadata service will then read, pull that message off the queue and then process it. And so given the non-rigid nature uh, of attraction metadata, I think a NoSQL database like DynamoDB could be a suitable storage option, and it's also quite flexible and scalable. And then we'll also want the metadata service to update the metadata index, and this could be implemented with something like Elasticsearch, as this will allow for efficient querying and re retrieval of metadata about a specific attraction. And then finally, after successfully storing the attraction details and initiating the metadata process, a response can then be sent back to the user indicating that the attraction was successfully created. So the next flow we're going to look at is the searching attractions flow. So let's say a user, they make a request to the API attraction search endpoint with a query search. The load balancer will then route this request to an instance of the attraction read service. And again, the load balancer ensures that the request is distributed evenly across the available instances uh, of the horizontally scaled attraction read service to ensure you know, high availability and optimal performance. The attraction read service will then first query Elasticsearch to find potential matches based on the query search. So this could be of you know, a restaurant type. And then we'd also include a bounding box, which would be slightly larger than the specified radius. And so what we're doing here is we're leveraging Elasticsearch powerful text search and filtering capabilities. Elasticsearch will then return a list of attraction IDs that match that, you know, in this case, restaurant type and fall within the broader bounding box. And what we're going to do then is we're then going to use the list of attraction IDs obtained from the Elasticsearch and then query the Postgres database to get the precise locations and details of these attractions. And so again, Post GIS, an extension of Postgres, PostgreSQL, provides that advanced spatial operations and precise distance calculations. And so this will help us accurately filter attractions that fall within the exact search radius specified by the user. The response is then sent to the user, and then the images associated with the retrieved attractions are also fetched from the CDN, and this ensures that images are delivered quickly and efficiently to the user. And so using this hybrid search approach of Elasticsearch and Postgres is very effective, as using Elasticsearch will reduce the number of records that need to be processed by the Postgres database, and then also we can use an attraction cache like Redis. And so what we can do here is cache common search queries in Redis to reduce the load on Elasticsearch and Postgres, which will significantly improve the response time for popular searches. And then to scale out the database, we could go with a leader follower replication. And so by implementing this, we can ensure that the system can handle that high read volume efficiently, given that this is going to be a, a far heavier read load than write load. And then we can also, given the nature of the data, accept eventual consistency, which will allow the system to scale and handle high read volumes without the need for real-time data synchronization. And then the final flow we'll look at is the creating a review for a specific attraction flow. So as always, the user will send a request, in this case, a post request to the API attractions uh, reviews endpoint. The load balancer again routes this request to an instance of the attraction write service. And then for the review database storage itself, given the high volume of reads relative to writes for reviews, a NoSQL database like Cassandra or DynamoDB is a good choice for storing reviews. These databases are designed for high scalability and fast read operations, making them ideal for handling large volumes of read requests efficiently. These databases use replication and partitioning to distribute data across multiple nodes, ensuring high availability and fault tolerance. And then we could also store frequently accessed reviews and aggregated data like average ratings um, in Redis to further improve response times as Redis is an in-memory data store known for its low latency data access. And so again, here's the complete architecture. Now that we've gone through some of the main flows, it should all make sense. And hopefully you'll be able to understand the role that each component plays within the overall architecture. And then finally, for some additional discussion points, you could discuss data consistency and integrity. So address how data consistency is main maintained across different services and databases, as well as discussing strategies for handling you know, conflicting updates or concurrent modifications. 
scalability and performance is also another key topic. So you could discuss how the overall architecture allows for horizontal scaling of different components, for example, the read services, write services, and databases. And you could highlight how the separation of read and write paths along with the ca caching strategies contributes to handling the high traffic loads. And then you could also mention some bottlenecks and how they can be addressed, you know, for example, using database sharding or caching layers. And then finally, you could also discuss monitoring and alerting. So discuss the importance of implementing robust monitoring and alerting mechanisms to ensure the health and performance of the system as well. And then you could also mention tools like Prometheus, Grafana, and AWS CloudWatch for monitoring database performance, request rates, error rates, and other key metrics. So hopefully you found this system design useful. If you did, like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. If you want to see the full write-up, it's on techprep.app. And hopefully I will see you in the next one.